A few months ago, in the first week of August, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of Five Nights at Freddy's. And if you've clicked on this video of your own free will, I don't have to explain to you what FNAF is. But shortly after the release of the original FNAF game, another game from Scott Coffin set in the Pizza Bear franchise came out, one that introduced a lot of new concepts to the franchise that are still talked about to this day. That's right, Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Nowadays, I feel like a lot of people tend to overlook FNAF 2, it just doesn't feel relevant anymore and isn't too useful for the FNAF timeline, right? Wrong. Today, I'm here to go over all of the unsolved mysteries and lore from the sequel prequel to Five Nights at Freddy's, because believe me, there's a lot to unpack here. And the stuff there is to unpack is actually pretty relevant to the lore of the games after this one, and the untrod ground I'll cover today might help unearth some answers to mysteries later on in the franchise. My objective today is to attempt to solve as many of the mysteries hidden in this game as possible, such as the identity of the animatronic who did the infamous Bite of 87, whether the toys are possessed or not, the origins of the shadow animatronics, and more. Lots more. This video is definitely my most ambitious one yet, and I've been working on this one in the background for a while, so I'm really excited to be able to put it out just in time for FNAF 2's 10th anniversary on the 11th. This big theory will be split into chapters on the many mysteries in the game with a complete FNAF 2 timeline at the end, so feel free to browse through them as you like. This video has every FNAF 2 mystery accounted for. Trust me. I do suggest you watch the whole thing for my full train of thought, whether it be actively or just leaving it on in the background while you draw or something else. So with that, put on your Freddy Fazbear masks, friends, and let's dive deep into the lore of FNAF's most overlooked and secretly important installment. I'm Withered Circle, and today we'll be solving all the mysteries from FNAF 2. To begin with, let's go over what we know about FNAF 2, the gameplay, dialogue, etc. FNAF 2 plays very similarly to the first game, with the main difference being an entirely new cast of characters and the absence of doors. Actually, that first one isn't entirely true, because the FNAF 1 animatronics are here too, or are they? In FNAF 2, the main two groups of characters we face off against are the Toys and the Withers, the new cast of characters and the old, respectively. There's also the Puppet, a weird character from an older location that sits in the prize corner, and Balloon Boy. But as I'm sure you all know, the Withered animatronics aren't the aftermath of what happened in FNAF 1, because FNAF 2 is actually a prequel to that game. Let me explain how Furious came to this conclusion. At the end of FNAF 2's fifth night, we get a paycheck in the name of Jeremy Fitzgerald, dated November 12th of 1987. In FNAF 1's phone calls, Ralph the phone guy brings up a mysterious event or to as the Bite of 87, obviously confirming that FNAF 1 takes place in the year after 1987. But where are we in this prequel? Why is there a separate Freddy Fazbear's from the first one? And where did the toys come from? It's explained in the beginning of the game that after the original Freddy Fazbear's pizza shut down, a new one was opened, with brand new characters, the toys, that were built of criminal detecting facial recognition software, likely to prevent the unknown person who committed the missing children incident at the original pizzeria from doing it again. However, the original characters from that pizzeria were brought into this new one. Nicknamed the Withered Animatronics, these ones are just as hostile as their toy counterparts. Bone Guy, who guides us through FNAF 2's nights, explains that these Withered animatronics were also supposed to be retrofitted with criminal detecting tech and general updates, but Fazbear's tech team called off the upgrades because of how ugly the animatronics looked and because of a mysterious smell coming from them and just used them for parts. The gameplay goes on with the player fending off both of these cast of characters until night 5, after which Jeremy Fitzgerald is given his first paycheck. And for many players, that's where the story of FNAF 2 ended. At least, for those players who didn't die a single time. FNAF 2 introduced the infamous death minigames that are so closely tied to FNAF now, with four minigames that gave us by far the most lore out of anything in FNAF 2 that were accessible by dying. These minigames were Take Kick to the Children, Foxy Go Go Go, Give Gifts Give Life, and Save Them. Let's break down each of the FNAF 2 death minigames and the lore they revealed. Starting with Take Cake to the Children, in this minigame you play as a weird yellowish Freddy Fazbear delivering cake to kids in a small room with a child crying outside the window. Eventually you start getting slower and slower as a purple car pulls up next to the room you're in. A pinkish purple man walks out of it, touches the child, and it dies. The minigame ends with a jump scare from the puppet. Foxy Go 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 is the simplest minigame out of these four. In it, you play as Foxy, walking from one room to the next several times as you are met with children and confetti. On your third lap, you see the same pinkish purple man in the corner of Pirate's Cove. As you walk into the next room, you are met with five corpses lying on the floor. The minigame ends with a jump scare from Withered Foxy. In Give Gifts Give Life, you play as the puppet. You move between four dead kids on the floor, giving them masks. Once you put on all four masks, the minigame ends with a jump scare from Withered Golden Freddy. But that's not all. If you look at the footage frame by frame, you can see a fifth victim lying in the middle of the room. And finally, the biggest minigame out of them all save them. In this minigame, you play as Withered Freddy in what appears to be the FNAF 2 pizzeria, judging by the toy animatronics on stage. As you walk around the building following the puppet, you can see corpses scattered across the whole pizzeria as the words save them are spelled out in the background. If you walk up to one of the bodies or go to the price counter, the minigame ends. However, there's a very low chance that in one of the rooms you pass by, a purple man will appear, with what appears to be his hand outstretched. He rushes towards the player as two words appear on the screen, you can't. 
you can't save them. So what were these minigames trying to tell us? Well, Take Cake to the Children is definitely about Charlotte Emily, the daughter of Henry Emily who ends up possessing the puppet in the games. The fact that the voice in the background spells out save him is likely a retcon, as we see these exact same events in another minigame from FNAF 6 about Charlotte, and we get a puppet jump scare at the end of Take Cake. So this minigame is telling us that there's a kid who gets killed by William and ends up possessing the puppet. Foxy Go 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 is a weird one. There's five kids here, which lines up to the five from the missing children incident that happened in the original Freddy Fazer's Pizza that we first heard about in the FNAF 1 newspapers. But the setting of this minigame is really weird. We know William killed the victims in the back room, not next to Pirate's Cove. So, what's going on? While it's likely that the idea of Foxy stumbling in on the MCI victims after William killed them was soft to retcon later on, there's some evidence that might point to the fact that this actually happened. In the Into the Pit game that came out this year, our player character Oswald goes into the ball pit and emerges on the other side of a hallucination caused by the agony and memories of the missing kids. In this weird memory pizzeria, Oswald sees a reflection of the five MCI kids and runs away. In the game, Foxy is completely absent, and the yellow rabbit that emerges from the agony hallucination takes over the body of Oswald's dad and uses it to interact with the real world. So what if Oswald also has to take over a body in the memory of Freddy's in order to interact with that restaurant? And what better body to steal than the only animatronic unaccounted for? Foxy. This not only explains what happened to Foxy and Into the Pit, but also ties back to Foxy Go 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 and how Oswald seeing the MCI victims perfectly mirrors Foxy seeing them in the minigame. Just some food for thought. Next up, Give Gifts Give Life is actually pretty simple. The five kids we see in this one are obviously the missing children we just talked about, whose names are Gabriel, Jeremy, Susie, Fritz, and Cassidy. And the puppet putting the Freddy masks on them symbolizes how Charlotte Emily is connecting their souls to their respective animatronics. Freddy, Bonnie, Chico, Foxy, and Golden Freddy. It's unlikely that the puppet actually stuffed the kids into the animatronics, since the purple guy, Willie Mathen, probably wasn't gonna just leave them lying around on the floor. And it's not like we see the puppet put them into the animatronics, just give them masks. And we know Freddy masks are relevant to souls, in possession thanks to the FNAF 3 Happiest Day minigames. But let's not get ahead of ourselves with overcomplicated lore from other games. And finally, save them. This minigame gives us the clearest look at the location it takes place in. As I said earlier, judging by the toy animatronics on stage and the Wooded Freddy we play as, it's clear this is the FNAF 2 location we play as in the night shifts of the game. But who are these dead kids? What's Purple Guy or William Afton doing here? And is this a separate murder spree from the missing children incident? Fans and theorists refer to these dead kids as the DCI, the dead children incident. Unlike the MCI who went missing, thus giving them their name, the DCI were just left dead on the ground where William killed them and he didn't even bother stuffing them into the the toy animatronics or even the withers. So, when does this happen, and why? Well, since this is the FNAF 2 location we're talking about, this incident must have happened in 1987, and we can approximate a date for the incident using Phone Guy's calls and Jeremy's paycheck. Jeremy Fitzgerald receives his paycheck for $120.20 on the 12th of November of 1987. On night 3, Ralph the Phone Guy alerts us to ignore any rumors we might have heard recently. Oh hey, before I go, uh, I wanted to ease your mind about any rumors you might have heard lately. Uh, you know how these local stories come and go and seldom mean anything. I can personally assure you that whatever is going on out there, however tragic it may be, has nothing to do with our establishment. There are only two possible candidates for what this tragic incident could be. It's either the infamous Bite of 87, which we'll discuss later, or this dead children incident we just talked about. Since the Bite of 87 almost definitely happens after the gameplay of FNAF 2, we'll stick with the idea that the tragedy Phone Guy is referring to is the DCI. I'll get to the Bite of 87 in a bit. Phone Guy also goes on to add that the day watchman hasn't reported anything unusual, and that he's on duty from opening to closing time. Since we get a paycheck after night 5, and the call occurs on night 3, subtracting 2 from 12 gives us the 10th of November of 1987. However, if there are already rumors circulating about this and the toys are already active on night one, then I'm willing to push the date of the DCI back by another three days to the 6th of November of 1987. The day watchman is almost definitely the purple guy we see in Save Them. He's got the purple security guard outfit as usual, but he also has a golden badge like a night guard at Freddy's would. Phone Guy also brings up on night four that the facial recognition software on the toys has been tampered with, and if you remember, this software was used to keep criminals away from the pizzeria, something that William Afton, the day shift guard and the purple guy would want to avoid. But anyway, who are the victims of the DCI? And most importantly of all, do they end up possessing the toys? In my opinion, I think it's likely that these five victims are actually older kids, possibly teenagers, attempting to sneak into Freddy's after hours. In the week before, the interactive FNAF novel that came out about two months ago, Ralph says that teens often try to sneak into Freddy's and retrieve pieces of Fazbear memorabilia to prove their bravery. Typical stuff. So what if these five kids are actually teens who broke into Freddy's at closing time, explaining why Afton was around to kill them and why they weren't stuffed into anyone? The corpses of these kids do look bigger and lankier than the ones from Give Gifts Give Life, so I think this hypothesis makes sense, and explains how these kids got into such a weird situation seemingly after closing time. But now, the real question. 
Do these dead kids end up possessing the toy animatronics? Well, as much as a lot of people like to say that these guys are 100% AI powered, I think they're definitely possessed. In one of the emails from FNAF AR, a tech complains to management that the wall and ceiling climbing mango animatronic is proving extremely difficult to build due to the fact that the team is unable to replicate the way the original mango moved in the 1987 location. Keep in mind that FNAF AR takes place around 40 years after FNAF 2, and even after that much time, they still can't get hydraulics that seemingly worked perfectly 40 years ago to work? Suspicious. Mango also moves seemingly by himself in the Save the Minigame, with her sprites in the files being called He Was Here. The movement seems to indicate that Mango is possessed in some way. But it's not just Mango. Toy Freddy and Toy Chica both have the iconic silver eyes over blank sockets, always an indicator of possession in certain renders on the cams and in the office. And if you're wondering why Toy Bonnie hasn't gotten himself any evidence of possession yet, he's got some too. One of the rare screens that you can get in FNAF 2 is of Toy Bonnie with completely blackout eyes, just like the rest of the possessed animatronics in both FNAF 1 screens and this game. There's also a theory that this incident isn't actually a new murder spree, meaning the toys aren't possessed, and it's just William Afton disassembling the FNAF 1 crew with a hand crank, the item he's supposedly holding in his sprite. And that's the reason the animatronics become withered. This is almost definitely not the case, because the puppet is telling you to save them, and since the puppet's already aware that the MCI are dead, there would be no point in saying that two years later in 1987. Also, if this was just Afton taking the corpses out of the animatronics, then why does phone guy refer to it as a tragic event, and why does future media say the MCI were never found if their bodies are right there. So, to put it simply, I think the toys are possessed by the souls of the DCI victims. After all, we know William would have been experimenting with possession after the MCI, so what other reason would he have to kill those kids? Now, you might say that the toys aren't possessed because the kids weren't stuffed into them this time, but since we see the puppet get possessed by Charlotte Emily in the security puppet minigame by just lying down next to her, that argument isn't too strong. So. Now that we hopefully agree on who the DCI are and whether the toys are possessed or not, let's tackle the mystery that's left Fear stumped for over a decade. Who did the bite of 87? Uh, they used to be allowed to walk around during the day, too. But then there was the bite of 87. Yeah. It's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe, you know? The Bite of 87 is arguably the oldest unsolved mystery in FNAF's decade-long history. First mentioned in the very first game, this event has become basically synonymous with FNAF. But who is it that did this bite? When in 1987 did they do it, and who was the victim? Those last two questions are probably the easiest to answer. On Night 6's phone call, the phone guy tells us that we're gonna be moved to the day shift for this Freddy Fazbear's location's last birthday party before it closes for good. There's good reason to assume that the player, Jeremy Fitzgerald, is actually the victim of the Bite of 87. In the week before, on page 29, Ralph says the following. Like you said in one of the training videos for the restaurant. You can't spell team without M and E. After the bite of 87, you heard some of the staff twist that around to, you can't spell team without M E A T. You didn't much appreciate that. People deal with tragedy and loss in their own ways, sometimes with humor. But hey, at least it shows that they were listening during orientation. The staff twisting team into meat seems to imply that whoever it was that suffered the bite of 87 was a part of the Fazbear's staff, just like Jeremy Fitzgerald. And we've got more proof that Jeremy suffered the bite at this party. Also in the week before, Ralph brings up that the victim wasn't able to do much of anything after the bite. Jeremy received his paycheck after night 5, and if he was completely brain dead by that point, it wouldn't make sense to give him the check then, since we know Fazbear Entertainment would do anything for a quick buck, including not paying their employees. Since we play as Jeremy on nights 1 through 6, it's fair to assume that the bite happens on what would be his 7th day. On the November 14th. But that's the easy bit. It's way more complicated to understand who did the bite of 87. Whoever it was has to have been at the FNAF 2 location in 1987, so that limits us to the 10 active animatronics we can encounter in FNAF 2. Withered Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy, Toy Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and the Mangle, Balloon Boy, and Withered Golden Freddy. I'll instantly rule out Golden Freddy and Balloon Boy, since neither of those two should influence the animatronics walking around during the day, which is something Phone Guy brings up. At first, I'd also rule out the Withered, since those weren't supposed to move during the day, which would leave us with just the toys. But yet again, the week before Interactive Novel drops another bomb. Shell. On page 166, Ralph notes that after the bite of 87, employees passed around suggestions to ward off the culprit. One of these was to use a flashlight on the animatronic to deter it. Ralph uses a flashlight against Foxy on that page, stunning him just as we see the flashlight do in FNAF 2. Foxy, or rather Withered Foxy, is the only animatronic in FNAF 2 this trick worked against, and later on in the book, Ralph says that Foxy's never bitten any kids. Almost as if he'd bitten a member of the staff before. An adult. You might be wondering what happened to the seemingly confirmed theory that Mangle did the bite of 87. After all, all the evidence was perfect, from him being a toy, to her jump scare animation going for the frontal lobe, but I guess going back to the original Foxy did the bite of 87 thing explains why his jaw is limp in FNAF 1 and why he's out of order in the first place. As to how Jeremy ended up in parts and service on his day shift, I suppose he was just doing his rounds during the party and that's why he got bit. To be honest, the week before seems pretty concise on who did the bite. As much as I wanted it to be Mangle, I don't mind the culprit being one of the withers that much. And 
while we're on the subject of the Withereds, there's another important debate in the FNAF Fierce community I have to address. What the Withereds look like before FNAF 2. The following question is a debate that's been raging in a specific pocket of the community for a long time. The design of the Withered animatronics before FNAF 2. If you look at the Withered and classic animatronics from FNAF 2 and 1 side by side, you'll notice that apart from the Withering, these two bands, which are supposed to be the same, look pretty different. Withered Chica has free toes instead of classic Chica's two, Withered Bonnie's face doesn't line up with classic Bonnie's, Freddy's jaw is completely different, Foxy's is two, and so on. So, the question on everyone's mind is whether the animatronics from the original 1985 Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, where the infamous Missing Children incident happened, look just like the Withered's but without the damage, or if they look like the ones we saw from FNAF 1. Let me explain these two lines of thought, and which one I believe. The first theory, that the Withereds are just broken versions of the OG cast, is called Unwithered Theory. The second is a bit more complicated, and we'll get into it in a second. Unwithered Theory is the one that makes the most sense at first. After all, if we know that the original animatronics from the 1985 location were brought over to this new pizzeria, it would make sense that these would functionally be the same as their Unwithered counterparts. The second, Retrofit Theory, states that after they were brought to the new location, these characters, who originally looked exactly like the characters from FNAF 1 were retrofitted with the new tech from the toys, but were scrapped at the last second because they look too ugly, explaining why they're missing parts or have broken pieces. The evidence for retrofit theory is actually very strong, because Phone Guy outright tells us that this is the case. By now I'm sure you've noticed the older models sitting in the back room. Uh, those are from the previous location, and we just use them for parts. Uh, the older models are the ones In case you can't tell, I'm a very strong believer of retrofit theory. It just makes much more sense because we've never gotten a canonical unwithered design for these characters unless you count the Fazbear fanverse. The animatronics from Into the Pit look way more similar to the original FNAF 1 cast and to the Withered from FNAF 2, and Phone Guy literally tells us that these characters were retrofitted. And in the week before, he also brings up that he's glad that the animatronics got their vintage look back, implying there was a period of time when they looked different. Withered. So, let me explain what happened to the animatronics as time went by, and how this lines up with the games. Essentially, when Freddy Fazbear's Pizza opened for the first time in 1983, the animatronics there looked nearly identical to the ones from FNAF 1, or literally just the same. When they were brought over to the 1987 location, Fazbear Entertainment tried to modify their design and add some of the new tech from the updated toy animatronic line, but due to the fact that they looked horrible and smelled worse, Fazbear gave up on that plan and just left them to rot, using them for pieces every so often. It's only when the FNAF 1 location is opened that the animatronics designs are restored to their original look. To be completely honest, this debate is kind of pointless, and the case for Unwithered Fury has been dead in the water for a long time at this point. But now that we're on the subject of questionably designed animatronics, let's move on to our next subject for the day, the most mysterious animatronics in FNAF 2 by far the shadow animatronics. FNAF 2 introduced us to the latest mysterious animatronic, or rather animatronics, with a very low chance of spawning and a very high chance of being lore relevant. Shadow animatronics, Rish 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 Rish, or Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy. RWQ has a 1 in 1 million chance of appearing on the left hand side of the player's office, standing in a corner and staring at you, and if you look at him for too long, he'll crash your game. Shadow Freddy can spawn in parts and service together with the withered animatronic sitting slumped in the corner of the room. Design wise, Rish Rish Rish, Rish looks like a Venta Black version of Toy Bonnie with glowing eyes and Teeth. Shadow Freddy is a sort of purplish recolor of Golden Freddy, specifically his withered variant, and he's complete with the missing ears and identical wires. But the real question becomes, who are these animatronics? What's their purpose in the lore? In the early days, a very strong theory for the identity of the Shadows was that they were the souls of two springlocked employees, with Freddy and Bonnie representing Fredbear and Spring Bonnie respectively. While this did make sense at the time with the evidence we were given, springlocks weren't a thing when FNAF 2 came out, and since Scott's storytelling was a bit more spontaneous at the time, I doubt he came up with them months in advance before the idea was introduced in FNAF 3. So, what are some other theories about the identities of the Shadow animatronics, and can we draw upon any of these for our conclusion on their nature? Another theory says that Shadow Bonnie is the agony from the death of Charlotte Emily, the kid from Take Cake to the Children who possesses the puppets. That pain manifested into a physical being, and Shadow Freddy is the same thing but with the agony of the bite victim from FNAF 4 who died because of Fredbear. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, in FNAF, agony is a sort of physical form of pain and suffering as the name suggests. It appears usually as a dense black goop, and sometimes as a darkish version of Remnant, which we'll talk about in a bit. But anyway, I like this explanation. To an extent. While Shadow Freddy being Crying Child's Agony makes sense, what with Shadow Freddy being a recall of Golden Freddy, who's literally Fredbear, the animatronic that killed the kid, Shadow Bonnie being Charlie's Agony made into an animatronic makes way less sense to me. Not only is Bonnie not at all involved with her death, but his design is literally Toy Bonnie, not just any rabid animatronic. So while I'm willing to consider Shadow Freddy being connected to the Crying Child, the connection of Shadow Bonnie to Charlotte doesn't feel as conclusive to me. There's also a theory that Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie, there's also a theory that Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie are manifestations of the true selves of the 
the two Freddy's founders, William Afton and Henry Emily. While you might think Bonnie is Afton and Fred vs. Emily, it would actually be the other way around since they're shadows, and shadows are inverted versions of ourselves, of course. We see Shadow Freddy as a malevolent force, usually helping Afton by learning the animatronics in Follow Me. There's also an ultimate custom night voice line from Nightmare, who's referred to as Shadow Freddy in FNAF Force Files, that says, I am your wickedness made of flesh. Since he's obviously talking to William in this voice line, it's reasonable to assume Nightmare is some kind of representation of Afton's wickedness, and thus Shadow Freddy is too. Shadow Bonnie is the foil of Freddy. He seems is a benevolent character across the franchise, helping a kid in FNAF 3's minigames and guarding remnant from the player in FNAF AR, protecting the soul energy from falling into the wrong hands, similarly to how Henry Emily, the co-founder of Fazbear Entertainment, only wants to protect the souls of the kids. This concept of Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie being polar opposites, as well as reflections of the original owners, is very interesting. But I've got another theory, with more proof, that is more likely. The idea that Shadow Freddy is an agony representation of the missing children incident and Shadow Bonnie is one of the dead children incident is really interesting. Not only do they both representing a member of the animatronic cast, Golden Freddy and Toy Bonnie, but both these animatronics have an additional tie to possession. Golden Freddy is obviously the most supernatural of the originals, and Toy Bonnie is the only toy with a rare screen in the game, and one of the kids in the Save the Minigame can be found slumped over right next to Toy Bonnie's leg. Now, you might be saying that since we've already established that the Dead Children incident happens around Night 2, Night 1, or somewhere at that point, Shadow Bonnie being able to appear on Night 1 debunks this theory. But to be honest, as lame as this might sound, it doesn't. It's important to remember that FNAF is a story, not a puzzle, and not every single piece of evidence will fit together perfectly. Plus, what are the odds of you getting Shadow Bonnie on the only night where it's probably canonically impossible? One in six million? I'll go even further and add that Shadow Bonnie might have been imbued of the puppet's protective personality. Unlike Shadow Freddy, who as I brought up earlier feels more like a pawn in William's scheme, Shadow Bonnie's a guardian of souls and remnant, just like the puppet who tried to stop the DCI on that fateful night, who tried to save them. Overall, I think this theory is more than likely. It's simple, it explains why Shadow Freddy is more connected to Afton than Rish Rish Rish, and feels like something that Scott could tangibly come up with, without making too many logical leaps. The William and Henry option is also possible, but I feel like this one is more likely. But the shadows aren't the only parts of FNAF 2 draped in darkness. In fact, there's a whole segment of the gameplay that almost no one in the theory space ever brings up. The FNAF 2 nightmares. So let's find out what they really are. If you've never played FNAF 2 or watched a playthrough of it yourself, you might be surprised to find out that this game has itself an entire series of post-night cutscenes with interesting lore. When you boot up the game for the first time, you're immediately thrown into your first cutscene. From the point of view of Freddy, you see what looks like the dining area from the original Five Nights at Freddy's, as well as the original fixed Chica and Bonnie on either side of you. You'll hear the sounds of ghostly children laughing before the game crashes with code on the upper left corner saying, Air. After night 2, the cutscene is the same, except now Chica and Bonnie are looking at you. After night 3, Chica and Bonnie look down on you angrily as Golden Freddy stands in front of you. After night 4, Golden Freddy is gone, replaced by the puppet, who blocks your view no matter which way you turn. After these last 3 cutscenes, when the game crashes, instead of saying air, like the first one, a different message will be displayed. It's me. Weird, right? Well, why did I call these weird cutscenes nightmares, and what do they even mean? The reason I and many others refer to these cutscenes as nightmares is because they literally are. In the files of FNAF 2, the assets for these sequences are labeled under Nightmare, so at least we know something about them. In fact, I think the nightmares in FNAF 2 explain what happened to the missing kids after they possessed their animatronics, in particular, one of these missing kids. I think that what we're seeing here is Jeremy, our night guard and player character, becoming affected or infested or whatever with the memories and pain of one of the original missing children, Gabriel. The Freddy Kid. Recall what we're using in FNAF 2 to ward off the animatronics. A Freddy mask. Remember how I brought up that withered Freddy's jaw and head in general looks nothing like the original Freddy when I was talking about the unwitthereds? What if Fazbear Entertainment completely replaced his face and gave us the excess mask? In Help Wanted, which supposedly contains the canon designs of these characters, the Freddy mask looks much more like classic Freddy. There's also a Fazbear Fright story called You're the Band, where a kid gets a Freddy mask for his birthday and becomes possessed by one of the missing children, having nightmares and remembering things he never experienced. Sound familiar? I think this is similar to what Jeremy is experiencing in these nightmares. He's seeing the memories of Gabriel, the MCI kid who goes into Freddy, through that kid's eyes. Golden Freddy and the puppet appearing adds more to this. Golden Freddy is a mysterious presence that watches over the FNAF 1 pizzeria, and the puppet is checking all the animatronics, likely to look for signs of life after it helped the missing kids possess them. The text that pops up when these scenes end, it's me, is very strongly connected to a person's realization that they are possessing something. While we used to think it's me was Golden Freddy's thing, both Freddy and Bonnie also say it in FNAF 1, and every single character except for Foxy says it in the week before, even Ralph when he dies and possesses a Freddy suit backstage at the end of the novel. So basically what these nightmares are is Jeremy experiencing what Gabriel saw when he possessed Freddy, darkness, and his fellow missing kids looking at him, realizing what happened to them. 
it's us. As to why these nightmares happen in what appears to be the FNAF 1 pizzeria, this is probably the stage from the original 1985 Freddy's and Scott just didn't have that at the time. You know, it did take him 10 years to make that pizzeria into a thing, so, you know, can't blame him. And that concludes the big mysteries from FNAF 2, but there's still some smaller ones we need to go over, so let's do just that. One weird aspect of FNAF 2's phone calls is that, at the very beginning of the very first call, Phone Guy refers to what we're doing as a summer job. As I often say, unless Ralph's in the wrong hemisphere, November is very much not summer in Utah. These calls, unlike the original FNAF ones, feel much more up-to-date, almost as if these are actual calls Ralph's having with the player as the night goes on, as he even comments on the player being at Freddy's during night 6, telling Jeremy to get out of there. So even though this question caused a fair amount of confusion, for good reason, the Phone Guy telling us this is a summer job is either a mistake on Scott's part, or just a way of saying Jeremy is doing an internship at Freddy's or something like that. There's also the identity of the custom night guard to discuss. After FNAF 2's night 7, or custom night, we get a termination notice for Fritz Smith. There's a very big chance this Fritz guy is none other than Michael Afton, or Mike Schmidt from FNAF 1. Fritz gets fired for the same reasons as Mike in FNAF 1, and Smith is just an alternate version of Schmidt if you think about it. If you want a more detailed explanation of Fritz, and why he's probably Mike, I suggest you watch the theory on screen right now by Zedrox, a fellow theorist friend of mine, as he goes more in depth on the subject there. It's a really good watch, I highly recommend it. A weird detail in FNAF 2, namely on the sixth night, is this incident that Phone Guy brings up. What on earth are you doing there? Didn't you get the memo? The place is closed down, at least for a while. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Now none of them are acting right. This can't be the DCI since we already established that it happened earlier and the building even had to go on lockdown because of it, so what's going on here? I was genuinely stumped for a really long time and just couldn't figure out an answer for this, but I think I might have an idea now. Since there's only two spare yellow suits that could possibly be in the back, Fredbear and Spring Bonnie, and Withered Golden Freddy's out and about teleporting all over the place, that leaves Spring Bonnie. What if it was William who used the Spring Bonnie suit to poke around for signs of possession from the toys and Withers after the DCI, and because of that they all became much more aggressive to staff, leading to the bite of 87. This feels like the most likely option to me. There's also the rarely seen End of O2 and JJ that can be spotted during the night gameplay. There's a bit of discussion over who the end belongs to and what JJ stands for, but to be honest, these two easter eggs aren't too important compared to some of the other ones. JJ is totally Joel and Joro, by the way. And with that, we've gone over pretty much all the relevant and lore important stuff from FNAF 2, at least to my knowledge. If I've missed anything, or if you think I've got something wrong, please comment and I'll keep it in mind. Just remember to keep it respectful. I'm planning to make a small video in a couple of days as a tie into this one, just in case I missed anything big from FNAF 2. But now, there's only one thing left for us to do. Ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and everything in between, put your hands together for the one, the only, complete Five Nights at Freddy's 2 timeline. The year is 1983, one dark rainy night a girl is locked outside a Fazbear location by some bullies. A purple car pulls up to the building, and the man walks out. He walks up to the girl. From inside the building, a Freddy animatronic watches. Something inside him tells him to save the girl, but he can't. The man, Willie Mafton, reaches out to the girl and pulls a shiny object, a knife, out of his pocket. In one fell swoop, a tiny breath of life is extinguished, but not for long. Years later, it's 1985. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza is doing great. Everything is going as it should, and business is booming. That is, until one June evening, when William Afton, co-founder of Fazbear Entertainment, kills five children in the back room, stuffing their bodies into the main four animatronics and an excess Fredbear suit after closing time, leaving behind a dark shadow created from the kid's pain. After this tragedy, Freddy Fazbear's is left to rot for two years. Two short years during which Afton has time to discover the powers of possession and remnant. Two short years during which the puppet, Charlotte Emily, helps the children come to terms with their possession the fact that it's them. Two short years before Alvin could come back to do it all over again. October 1987. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza comes back with a blast, starring new animatronics with built-in facial recognition and security software, presumably to keep Afton away from this pizzeria, as well as the original ones from the previous location. Unfortunately, Fazbear Entertainment's plan of retrofitting these ones didn't work due to how ugly they looked. They scrapped the project and dumped the now broken and battered Fazbear mascots in parts and service. On the night of the 6th of November, right before the next night guard starts his week, William Afton sneaks into the pizzeria right around closing time using his alias as a day shift guard, and kills five teens sneaking into the pizzeria. They try to run, but they're no match. He eventually collects their bodies and disposes of them in a discreet location. When the puppet comes to, she tries to save them, but she can't. Or can she? Somehow, the toys are now possessed by these kids, becoming aggressive and taking on traits similar to the originals. On the night of the 14th, Afton comes back to check on his new creation using the signature Spring Bonnie suit, and sure enough, judging by the sudden anger of both new and old characters, these new toys are possessed as well, and the old ones are still there. On the 14th of November, Jeremy Fitzgerald, the second night guard at this location, is moved to the day shift for this location's last birthday party. 
Unfortunately for Jeremy, this is likely going to be his last birthday party as well. His last birthday party. Ever. The old and battered foxy animatronic lashes out at him and bites off his frontal lobe, leaving him mindless and the pizzeria guardless. Freddy Fazbear's closes its doors shortly after. But the story of Fazbear Entertainment is far from over. And that is the complete lore of FNAF 2. I'm sure I missed something or mixed up a date or two, so if you spotted something, please tell me in the comments. But as I said, keep it respectful. And if you enjoyed this theory, please tell me in the comments too. This video was a lot of work to put together, and I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing as it's very helpful. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, keep on theorizing and never stop overthinking. This has been Withered Circle, the Midnight Fury.